So we're talking about the pursuit of happiness on these nights. Um, and I love it because it's fun, but I also love it because scripturally, uh, the Bible repeatedly talks to us about life in God is supposed to be enjoyable. Um, in the Amplified Version, if you go to 1 Timothy 6.17, it says this. It says, um, but on God, who richly and ceaselessly provides us with enjoyment, for, with everything for our enjoyment. And so I realize that when we talk about the pursuit of happiness, it isn't that we're trying to hype anybody up. We're not trying to make something up. We're not trying to do any of these different things that sometimes can happen. But the, the pursuit of happiness really is a place of understanding that life with God is supposed to be fun. And it's supposed to be full of joy and excitement. And you're supposed to feel happy and entertained. And we're supposed to be the people who, when the people in the world look around for a group of people that are loving life and excited, that they would find us and would be interested to know, what is it that you have that I can grab a hold of? And that's life with God. And we realize that when we look through Scripture is that people were able to go through trials and tribulations uh, because they were experiencing something that was so much greater than those trials and tribulations. And that is life with God. And so as we talk about this concept of the pursuit of happiness, really what we're looking to pursue is life in God. Because life in God is full of happiness. We know the scripture tells us that one of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. And joy is that inward force, that inward reality where because everything in me is so good, that there is this force of life, this force of happiness that exudes out of me. That life with God isn't supposed to be dry or empty or shallow or meaningless. It's not supposed to be hard. But life in God is an adventure. It's an everyday exciting journey that we get to walk with him. So let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we're thanking you for this evening. Lord, we want to know you, and we know that the more that we get to know you, the more that we realize that you are, you're about creating enjoyment in our life. Like that scripture says that you've given us everything to richly enjoy. Lord, that's, that's the reality we want to live in. That's the place we want to live. We want to live in a place where we understand that you're good and you're for us, and that you've set things out in our life not to hurt us or to harm us, not to beat us down. Or, but Father, you've placed things in our life to show us how good you are. And Lord, our desire as we learn, as we talk through this pursuit of happiness, Lord, that what we're doing, doing is we're tuning our ears and our eyes to see the things that you've already done. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so um, the topic that we're going to talk about tonight, last week, uh, for those of you that remember, remember, we talked about gratitude. And really the force of gratitude, and if you were able to be with us, I would encourage you to hop online, you could watch it, or go online and do some studying for yourself about this concept of gratitude. Because it's amazing how uh, when we can exude or when we can intentionally purpose uh, within ourselves to live a life of gratitude, how, you know, we went through some of the statistics last week, and it one of the statistics that is, I think about off the top of my head is somebody who does an act of gratitude, right, whether it's, you know, you think about something, anything that, you know, thank, where you're thankful or you're, you know, giving gratitude, it was, there was an instant 10% boost in your mood, and an instant 35% reduction of depressive symptoms from a single act of gratitude, okay? And this is really what we're talking about. And, and I apologize if you came here and you were looking for some deep theoretical hermeneutical study on the book of Leviticus. You will not be getting that tonight. Um, what you will be getting, however, is an in-depth understanding of our human nature that God has created us and tapping into the forces that he created so that we can stop feeling like life is just so drab and boring and dark and hard because that's just not the that's not the life that the New Testament existence that we're supposed to be living and so tonight we're going to talk about last week we talked about gratitude this week we're going to talk about generosity turn to your neighbor and say I'm generous 
Generosity is, if you're to study what living a life of happiness and how to live happy, the very first thing that they'll teach you to do is how to live a life of gratitude. The second thing that they'll talk to you about is living a generous lifestyle. Uh, you know, I, and I can remember this, and, and really, because generosity is one of those funny things in life, because uh, uh, I've learned this. I love when people are generous towards me, don't you? I love it. I love when people, you know, open up their wallets and hand out fat stacks to me. Uh, but when God or should God ever ask me to pull out my wallet and hand out some fat stacks, it's funny how it feels different, doesn't it? It feels different when you are the giver rather than receiver. You know, I, I remember this uh, with Danielle in my relationship. And when we first started dating, this was seven or eight years ago, um, I can remember that I was so focused on really rating how well she was doing at loving me. You know, anybody in a relationship ever gone through a season like that where you're really, really focused on how well that person is loved? It's amazing how the other person in a relationship never loves you as much as you love them. Has anybody in a relationship ever said that to your significant other? Okay. And this is the thing I can remember. I was so critical and I was so judgmental um, really towards her and trying to help her to understand how to love me better. And I realized that, you know, it was funny how it seemed as though she could never do enough. And I remember, um, it was, I can't remember what it was the event, um, but my, I think it was Easter or something. And my mom bought each of us, you know, one for her and my dad, one for uh, Jess and Mike, and one for me and Danielle. She bought us the Love Dare book. Anybody know what the Love Dare book is? It was that book that came out, and it's basically a 40-day marital challenge. Um, and the crazy thing about the Love Dare book was the Love Dare, I really wanted the Love Dare to show up and tell Danielle <laughs> that she needed to love me better. Um, but the Love Dare book wasn't that. In fact, what the Love Dare book was talking to us about was is that if you want to create a better relationship or a more sustaining relationship, you got to stop focusing on what the other person is doing for you and focus on what you can do for the other person. And that's what this Love Dare book was all about. It was all about 40 days and every day of the 40 days it gave you a challenge about how you could be generous in some way buying a gift, saying something, writing a letter, whatever it was. And I can remember that in this process of going through this, and, you know, since then we've gotten so much better because we've learned each other, but I can remember how going through this 40-day process and focusing on giving rather than focusing on receiving, it made me feel so much better. And it, it, it really had nothing to do with how, what she was doing. But my generosity was creating an environment where I really enjoyed the relationship. But I noticed something else about that when, as I stepped into this place with the love dare, I realized that not only was it making me feel good uh, because I was doing nice things for Danielle, but it was amazing how my acts of generosity were creating an environment inside of my relationship for her to want to be generous in giving love towards me. Now, you may have never experienced an event like this, but everybody faces things like this in our life. We find ourselves wanting to be the recipient rather than being the giver. Okay? So often, I, and, and I do this in relationships at so many different times, and sometimes I can even catch myself in my relationship with Danielle is so desperately and almost angrily sometimes waiting for that person to step out and give me the love that I feel like I need. Whether it's through fear or insecurity, whether it's rejection, essentially what we can so easily do is give the power of happiness, the power that we should hold for ourselves to create the world that we want to live in, we so often give it to other people around us and allow them to determine the level to which we experience happiness. In fact, when I was doing some studying, um, well, and, and this is the thing about it is God's system works the total opposite. We're going to read a scripture in a second that says this, that if we want to receive, we first have to give. 
And so as I was studying about this, because that's what I want to do, I don't want to just come up with ideas. I want to really understand what does it look like and what does generosity produce in people's lives. So there was a study that was done. And in this study, there was two groups of people, and each of the groups of people were given $5. And there was only one instruction. To one group, their instruction was, I want you to take this $5, and I want you to spend it on yourself. Now, this study must have been done in like the 60s, when $5 actually meant something, because I feel like, what is $5? But this one group was given $5, and their only objective was to spend this $5 on themselves, and the other group was given $5, and the only objective for them was to spend that $5 in some way being generous towards someone else. Now, what was funny and was unexpected in the study was that the group who gave the $5, rather than spent it on themselves, were measurably happier and experienced a higher chemical endorphin reaction in their brain than the people who spent the $5 on themselves. Now, it goes on, because the beautiful thing was, is that the people's brains, and this is the way the study went, is that they were were checking the chemical endorphin levels in people's brains. And so their brains, even though they didn't receive anything, their brains registered pleasure as if they had received something out of the deal. Now, what was even more interesting about this was that although when the the people would spend $5 on themselves, they would experience some um, endorphin increase in their brains, but it was very short-lived Now, the people who gave the $5, they had an equal response in the act of giving. However, that uh, endorphin level continued, what does it say? It continued to release for three months just simply by recounting the event of them giving away that $5, okay? Now, there's so many more statistics. It's actually crazy. In a relationship generosity is in the top three must-dos for happiness and longevity. And this is what they say, is that it's actually better to give small gifts inside of a relationship. It's better to give sporadic small gifts than to give just like one giant gift on a certain event. And that, that generosity, like buying something or writing your spouse a love note or something like that, it actually is, is shown to cause there to be an increase in happiness, and an increase in longevity. Parents with their children. Children are more likely to take care of their parents as their parents age. Parents who are more generous towards their children are more likely... I'm just saying. (laughs) Parents who are generous with their children are more... It is coming, actually, August 10th, everybody. Children whose parents are more, come on, I'm trying to get through the facts here. (coughs) Children whose parents are more generous are more likely to support their parents as their parents age. People who are generous, this is, so now this is people who are aging throughout their life. So people who are in the older person category, I'm trying to think of like the most politically correct way to say that, older in age in years. People who maintained a generous attitude towards life felt 76% healthier. 94% of those people had, had an increased mood, and they experienced 78% less stress. Okay? Now, generosity goes even further. People who have chronic illnesses like HIV or multiple sclerosis experienced increased health benefits simply by being generous. Financial generosity has the same happiness-boosting effect as doubling your income. And states, in, in America, this is where these studies came from, states who give big, they are known to be happier, they have lower divorce rates, And they have stronger family ties. And these are just a few of the statistics out there talking to us about what it looks like to be generous. And of course it would be that way. 
Because we know that generosity, God constantly throughout Scripture encourages us to be generous. Oh, and also, giving to a church, like, because maybe some people feel like it's crazy that we give, and some people might feel like it's, but giving to a church is the highest, 34%, which is the highest bracket of charitable giving in the world is churches. So more so than like organizations or charities, 34% of charitable giving is given to churches. And so we're not alone. Like people really give to churches and that's a great way to give. Okay. And so like I said, in Luke chapter 6, verse 37, it says this, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. We're seeing a pattern here. I am extending first in order to receive. And verse 38 says this, give and it will be given unto you. A good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over, will it be poured into your lap. For the, me- the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so as I look at this scripture and I look at my own life and the different things that I've gone through in my life, I realize something that God is constantly telling us throughout scripture is that when we want to be a recipient, rather than waiting around to be a recipient, God is encouraging us to create around us an environment of generosity Because the scripture tells us that when I am generous and the measure to which I am generous creates an environment around me of generosity. Now, I love this about God because God is always so much above and beyond just one thing. You notice that God has got, you know, God is, you do one thing and there's like 20 benefits that come from doing that one thing. And so when I think about generosity, I realize that Not only when I'm generous, is it going to have mood-boosting effects in my life? Because really, I mean, mood-boosting would be enough, right? If I could just, you know, give something, I'm feeling bummed out, and so it's like I'm just looking to give something away because I need a mood booster, okay? That would be amazing if that would be just the only thing that I would experience. But what God is telling me is, Not only is this going to boost my mood and make me feel good, it's also going to create an environment around me where because I gave, I set a spiritual principle into motion, which now creates a magnet around me for people to give back to me. You understand what I'm saying? And so when I look at generosity, it's like a two-edged sword. It's on one hand, when I give, I feel good. And on the other hand, when I give, I get, which also makes me feel good. And so I realized from this that as God has set these principles into motion, is that really all we have to do is begin to step into these things. That God has already instructed us. I mean, when we talk about what people are searching for in the world nowadays, if you go on Google and you find out the number one thing or the top 10 things that people are searching to try to find out how to have more of, I tell you, money is very low on that list. People are looking for peace and joy, and they want to feel happy, and how do I feel good, and how do I love my spouse, and this is what people are looking for, and what God has established in his scripture is he's saying, listen, all you have to do is do these few simple things. And you'll, you'll experience, and this is what these studies are beginning to show. And you read Forbes magazine or, you know, entrepreneur.com, and they're tapping into these things where they're realizing, like, if you go and you look at the, you know, the, if you were to get mentored by some of the upper echelon of rich people, one of the things that they will tell you to do, I mean, I read blogs about it. One of the top things that they say that you need to do is you need to find a charity you need to give to it. They don't necessarily know why. I was reading about, what's the guy that you like, the older guy? Warren Buffett gives away 70 per... Your basic definition of him was that he was older. Older guy. <laughs> that older, rich, baller dude. Is that better? Is that right? Did I get this right? This is vile. It says that he gives away 73% of his income to charity. There's multiple billionaires who give away at least 10% of their income to charities. And so we realize as we look at this that these principles that God is talking to us about 
aren't, and, and we can always do this, right? We could skim over them and lightly, but as we're talking about the pursuit of happiness, there is not a, a magical pill that comes in the back of your Bible, you know, that's like, just hit, pop this pill three times a day and you'll be happy. What the Bible teaches us is principles like generosity. And so the main three areas, and, and I'm really closing with this because that clock is rolling down quickly. The main three areas that people talk, as you, if you were to study about this, the main three areas that they encourage people to be generous are these. Number one is to be generous in your time. This is one of the studies said that people who volunteer their time feel that they're able to be more productive in the time that they have left and not less. That because, so they give their time, because there is a mood boosting effect, because they feel as though their life matters and all the different things. Now, even though technically they have less time in the day, they're able to accomplish more because of the mood boosting or whatever it is effect that's happening on the inside of their brains. Okay? Like I said, it's one of the, oh, it, it also has an increased sense of that what they're doing in their life matters. That so often, so many people feel, and I hear this all the time coming from people, is, you know, what's the point? Why does it matter? Right? I'm, I'm doing all these things. And people who volunteer or are generous with their time experience this euphoria because they feel as though they're living for something bigger and more valuable than themselves. Okay? Now, this might look like serving in a church, for example. If you'd like to serve in the church, you could see Amy. Sign-ups will be in the hallway after service. It could look like serving at a church. It could look like babysitting your grandchildren. Helping a friend move. Thank you to everyone who recently helped me move. Okay? Anything in any area of your life that you're giving time and not being compensated in any way for the time that you're giving. Number two, that you're generous in your finances. The wealthy consider, like I said, benevolence or generosity as one of the unseen forces in the universe. And it's one of the main things that they teach people to do in order to increase financially. Giving, financial giving inside of a marriage, where like you buy a gift or something. Did you know that actually gift cards, when people were surveyed, the, 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 the highest category of gifts that people wanted to receive were gift cards. And so no condemnation if you're the, that gift card buyer. People want gift cards. There's, right, there's no excuses to not be generous. Just buy a gift card, okay? Giving in marriages is linked to an overall satisfaction in a marriage, okay? And like I said, a gift card can show, a gift card to a friend is shown to strengthen the bond. Here you go, read that, catch this. This is crazy, because I'm just giving you facts, folks. Men, this is here the thing. If you're dating a man, okay? No, no. If you're a man dating a man, I guess that would work too. But if you're anybody dating a man, technically, I guess. If you're dating a man, men, this is crazy. When men receive a good gift from their girlfriend, they are more prone to being happy and seeing a, a long future with that girlfriend. This is true. This is true. This is, this is reality. And so we realize that as we talk about these things, and it might seem funny, and we might seem like too practical that it maybe is annoying to you, but I got to be honest, is, is that as we look through our life and we feel in these moments of frustration and dissatisfaction, what God has set out for us is a very simple model in order to experience, you know, happiness and to experience this euphoria that we're supposed to experience in life because we live with God. And the third area is to be generous in our love. In relationships, very simply, look for ways or opportunities to love people. Write a thank you note. Pick up trash outside. People say that. Picking up five pieces of trash. I, I don't know how they know this. But picking up five pieces of trash on an outing has a great ability for it to boost your mood. Okay? Picking up trash. Okay? Um, inviting a neighbor to dinner, okay? And so instead of looking for ways to receive, what we're doing in our life is we're looking for ways to give. 
Because this is what I've realized, is that when we're waiting to receive something, when we're waiting for our spouses or our friends or our, our jobs or our bosses or whatever it is, if we're waiting for them to make the first step to be generous, to make us feel good, we're giving the power and the control of the satisfaction that we were supposed to experience in life, we're handing that over to somebody else. Instead, what we do when we simply apply God's principles to our lives, we're taking back the power and saying that I have the ability to choose the way that I want the outcome to happen in my life. And not only do I know that when I give and when I'm generous, I know that I can experience good things and these euphoric feelings, but I also understand that God is using it as the way to increase in my life. And so ushers, can we pass out those things really quickly? I got these handouts. Okay? Maybe just a couple of people, actually. If you're somewhere in the back, <laughs> grab some of those papers. Let's hand them out. So what this handout is, is this handout is amazing, and it's just simply three categories. Okay? Can I just see one so I can explain it to everybody? Thank you. It's three very simple categories. And last week, everybody got the 30. How's everybody doing on their 30-day challenge? Awesome. How many people did at least one of the days last week? Wow, good for you. How many people did two days? Less hands. Less hands. How many people did three days? Wow, so some people are really killing this. Good for you guys. That's so amazing. Okay, because this is one of the things that I've learned in Christianity and really in life is, is that sometimes when we're going through life, we really want to feel good and we want to experience these feelings. But it requires that we actually take the initiative in our own life. Why? Because we have the power over our own lives. And so when I want to feel good and I, I feel like I'm stressed out and I'm bothered and I'm all these different things, okay, now that's why I need to go into my drawer and I need to pull up my 30-day thing and I need to do it, right? That's why I have the Love Dare and I have all these different books that I own that are these like daily challenges because I understand that if I am feeling not good or I'm stressed out or I'm feeling disappointed or discouraged, I have no one to blame except for myself. And not only that, but I know that there's an easy way to get out of it. Okay? So this is my next challenge for the week for you. Okay? Three categories. This is tough. This is going to require some real vulnerability from everybody. <laughs> All right? The first category is what did I do? And, and also, when you keep account, like I would say, like, you need to have, we need, we need a journal as human beings. Like, we just need to become journal people. Having a gratitude journal, I think we talked about it maybe last week, but having like a gratitude journal and a generosity journal, it's amazing because, you know, doing something and writing in the journal has benefits, but just going backwards and recounting areas where we did something that was nice essentially has the same uh, mood-boosting effect in our life. You like that? Doesn't mood-boosting sound good? Yeah. I want that. I want to be mood-boosted. Yeah. It's a great thing. Mood boosting TM. It's going to be a new pill that I saw. Um, so first category is what did, what did I do? And so this is simply just, I wrote a love note. I paid, we crossed the bridge, and I paid for the person's toll behind me. I, did you also know what's crazy? I got, there's so many facts out there. My brain is full of facts right now. But actually, when you do random acts of kindness, you remember that we pay it forward or that concept of pay it forward? That that's actually true. That when you are generous, you actually create an environment around you for people around you to desire to be generous. Okay? So that's how we're going to change a city. Can I tell you something? We change a city and we change people's lives by simply doing these random little things that actually matter and are significant in people's lives. And we create an environment for them to begin to experience. Like what we saw on that sign. We went from being Fort Dreary to a growing and prosperous community. Yeah. Okay? And how do these things happen? These principles happen because we simply sow the word of God and we act on the word of God and we begin to watch as those mood-boosting effects begin to change our city. Call it number one, what did I do? You're going to write down, what did you do? Pretty self-explanatory. Second column, also pretty self-explanatory. How did they respond? You're just going to write down how they responded. Maybe they weren't happy. Maybe they cried. Maybe they were whatever. And the third category was how did I feel? Okay. And that's all that I want you to do. And I want to, and maybe we're going to start doing testimonies. I don't know. We're just throwing that out there. That could be crazy. We could lose a lot of time by doing testimonies. But I feel as though this summer, what we're really embarking on is really an understanding 
of what does it honestly look like to begin to take back the power of our lives and create in ourselves the life that we desire to live. Not waiting on other people, not waiting on everything in our life to be perfect or to line up. Because I've got to tell you, that's just never going to happen. There's always going to be stuff in our life that can bother us. But what we do is we combat that with the word, which looks like generosity. In Jesus' name, amen. Love y'all. You're all amazing. That's all I got. Thanks so much for joining us today. We pray your life was impacted by the service and that you were able to feel the tangible love of Jesus fill whatever space you're listening from. Maybe you found this message and you've never had the opportunity to come into a personal relationship with Jesus, or you've known about him but have been far from him. We want to give you the opportunity to make his love a daily reality in your life. Jesus came to this earth and died on a cross so that you and I could be close to him. He wanted to wipe away every disappointment and bring you into a life of purpose and meaning, one that will impact this globe for good. So if you'd like to begin this journey with Jesus today, then repeat the simple prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I'm praying this prayer because I know that I've made mistakes and have been living without you. I apologize and I trust that you will forgive me. I accept your love and grace and ask that you would be my Lord and Savior. Help me believe in you and love you every day. Help me to show the world what you're like and how great your love is. I commit to live for you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name, amen. All of our Light City family are joining with heaven and celebrating over the commitment you just made to have Jesus as the Lord of your life. We have resources available for you to help you on this journey, but most of all, we're praying for you. Send us a note at info at golightcity.com to let us know about the decision you've made today. We have resources we'd love to send you uh, with some easy steps on how to go from here so that you can discover God in a real and meaningful way. If you have a prayer request, our team would love to connect with you and partner with you to see God transform your life. God bless you, and we look forward to hearing from you soon.